Vitek. Uh, I'm working as a software engineer at the Red Hat. And I'd like to introduce you to the USB Dark project. And I want to actually start with a story of how I got interested so much that I go to the school. And this is probably the oldest uh, reference to a, uh, a USB based uh, attack uh, on, a, on a company. It's not a black hat attack, uh, it's actually, uh, it, was, uh, it was actually uh, ordered by a customer from my penetration testing company. Uh, and they have uh, told them to not to use social media or emails or some of the usual attack vectors uh, in the company. So they have to think about something else. And they actually uh, did something which uh, three years later they are calling uh, bit USB. But they did it in uh, like a creative way by uh, uh, modifying the hardware. Uh, they took apart the mouse, USB mouse, uh, put inside a USB hub and a USB thumb drive and connected it to the wire the mouse was using to, to communicate with the computer. So, and they then wrapped it in, inside a nice box and uh, gave it to somebody uh, in the company as a, as a gift. So, I naturally uh, would uh, think that uh, such a device would uh, do something to a computer. So they connected it uh, and uh, using the usual outer and uh, the vector, uh, the system actually runs some malware from, from the device. So you connected a mouse inside your computer and it suddenly uh, connects to some thumb drive to your system and runs sort of uh, That's uh, pretty unusual. Right? So, uh, as I said, uh, it's, uh, it's like a primitive way of doing a bad USB attack, which uh, was presented in uh, 2014. Uh, so let's uh, show some uh, uh, to the uh, usual attack because which are paid really uh, uh, So, uh, before we get to actually to uh, explain what bad USB is, uh, most, uh, the most used attack vector is, as I said, uh, the outer and some outer feature of the play pixel itself. And just connecting uh, a, a storage device to the to computer and relying on the user or, or on the outer and feature to run the malware. Uh, the solution to this is to, of course, to disable outer run, which is outer run is uh, a strict feature. Uh, don't do that. Uh, and to educate users and not to run. Uh, software from random devices. Uh, so, what can you do uh, as an attacker if uh, somebody uh, educates the users and uh, disables OutRun? You can uh, uh, so emulate OutRun using uh, uh, the USB protocol itself. You can be the, uh, like, the device can be the user himself, like, uh, typing uh, commands and moving the mouse uh, on the computer, but uh, automatically from the device. So that's uh, 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 what I call uh, road USB devices. Uh, that are like devices that uh, like uh, uh, USB thumb drives or something that you wouldn't expect that uh, uh, they'll uh, execute some uh, mouse movements or keystrokes on a computer. Uh, but uh, the USB protocol actually allows that. It allows that uh, one device can act as uh, multiple devices at once. And uh, actually, these uh, uh, devices are you can buy you can buy them from eBay for twenty dollars. They call it the Tinsy USB drive by, and uh, there are other <laughs> small devices available. So. Another attack vector is the reprogramming of USB devices. Uh, uh, that's what, what we call bad USB today. Uh, that's uh, like, a, uh, as I explained, the uh, modify, modifying the uh, USB mouse by hardware means. This is like modifying in the same way, but by software means. Uh, it, it requires uh, knowing the protocol and how the manufacturer uh, uses uh, to send firmware to the device. So we have to reverse engineer and it's a bit higher. 
but it was done by the guys who present, uh, who uh, created the bad USB attack uh, on some uh, used, uh, commonly used uh, chipsets. Uh, and uh, uh, last but not least uh, is the uh, attack vector and uh, USB drivers itself. So uh, usually, and for in Linux, in the Linux kernel, there is uh, nothing that uh, prevents to uh, uh, connect uh, a, uh, any, any USB device and have the drivers of the USB device loaded automatically. You can, you can blacklist them, but you have to do it manually and you have to know it beforehand. So what, uh, like what, what, do you, what you don't want to load, and if somebody uh, creates a new driver, then it's installed it's automatically and you have, like, you have to edit the blacklist. And uh, there is actually a CV, uh, quite serious one, uh, from 2013, where there was uh, a uh, heat-based uh, morphine also found in a USB device driver. And uh, it was, I think, found by the fuzzing of the USB drivers. And uh, as I heard that uh, there are some uh, non-public ones in the cube. So, uh, if you want to somehow solve it uh, in your company or on your desktop com computer, you can use uh, uh, one of uh, two uh, uh, things. You can either uh, uh, completely disable your uh, USB ports, either by uh, BIOS means or uh, by ripping out the, the connectors or gluing your devices inside the connectors. Or you can use actually a USB guard. So this is a uh, like one minute uh, how to uh, set up your uh, how to set up set up USB guard in your system. Uh, if you are using Fedora, then uh, you can just uh, paste these commands. Uh, if you are using Ubuntu or something else, then you have to replace the first command to install actually the packages or compile them. They are not available on your distribution. Uh, using the second line, you can uh, generate uh, a policy for your devices uh, that are uh, connected to, to your system at the moment the command is executed. So it creates a whitelist for, for the connected devices, and nothing else will be allowed to connect to your system. If some, some uh, uh, other device that is not known to the policy or to USB guard is connected, and if you run the applet, then you get a notification, okay, there is a new device, it has these interfaces, would you want to allow it or not? Or do you want to reject it? So, if you allow it, then what happens is that uh, uh, it will allow uh, the, the kernel to continue with enumeration of the interfaces on the new device and load the uh, uh, interface drivers. Otherwise, uh, it will just block block the device node and not touch any any code uh, whatsoever in any uh, USB driver, uh, but the USB core driver. So it's the only only uh, driver exposed uh, to the USB device. Uh, you can also reject the device. That means uh, that it will be uh, like uh, the device node will be also uh, <coughs> removed from from the system. Like uh, the kernel won't know about it anymore. You have to like uh, uh, disconnect the device and connect it again. So uh, this is the high-level overview of USB guard. It's a typical Unix daemon uh, which is uh, running all the time and listening for uh, UDF, uh, notifications about new new connected devices and. About the changes on the devices. And it relies also on <coughs> the second feature of the Linux kernel, and that's the Linux uh, USB device authorization feature. Uh, it's a, a boolean flag for allowing the the like the continuation of uh, uh, the um, USB interface driver lo loading. So uh, it's uh, thanks to these two features uh, of, the, of the kernel. Uh, the USB card can work as it as it does. <coughs> also, there are optionally uh, the CLI and UA packs 
uh, which you don't have to run, but uh, it's much easier than to interact with the demon. You don't have to edit the files by yourself and generate the policies and write them. So, there are some uh, of the uh, advanced and blind features. Uh, the basic uh, functioning of USB guard is uh, just blacklisting and whitelisting uh, on, uh, on matching the uh, device attribute that, uh, that the device uh, exports to the system. Uh, that, that, that is uh, the, the list of the requested interfaces that, uh, for the, to interact with the system uh, and some serial numbers, supported protocols, uh, and, and uh, like basic stuff that the USB specification uh, tells the devices to, to export. Uh, but you can use actually uh, the, the one of these uh, advanced features to, to make like uh, more complex policies or more more intelligent policies. Uh, one of them is uh, the room conditions. Uh, you can match like the, you know, the actual uh, the current conditions of the system, like uh, the context of the connected devices. So you can write a, a rule uh, which uh, uh, like allows a device only if another device is connected or not. Uh, um, it uh, allows you to like uh, check uh, what the time of local time of the system, so you can allow the device uh, if it's working hours or not. And some other basic uh, conditions are implemented. But uh, the list of the conditions uh, is kind of expanding, uh, so I, and I'm looking for use cases to implement uh, the uh, Currently, I'm working on USB I/O monitoring. Uh, that's I/O monitoring like in uh, uh, input and output data and bandwidth. So you can, uh, uh, like, you, after it's implemented, you can say, uh, "Okay, I have, I have this sun drive, and I don't want that people." Upload the data uh, to the sun drive. They can read from that, but they can uh, uh, they cannot uh, upload any data or only small amounts of data which are required for communicating with the device. Uh, that's uh, good for uh, the data exfiltration use case. You, you don't want to like uh, if people uh, uh, exfiltrate data from your company on your device, but you you you, you want to uh, let them use. Uh, fun drives to actually distribute some data in the company or on the servers. Uh, another uh, plan feature is uh, device signing. That's actually the original idea of the for the implementation of the USB kernel authorization uh, feature. Uh, but the guy who implemented it, uh, he didn't actually continue uh, to in a way. Uh, to uh, like actually implement the, the, the device signing. Um, another uh, thing I, I like to like, improve is the UI of the, the applet. As you can see, uh, it's like um, not really useful uh, to see some numbers here, which represent the uh, interfaces that uh, the device uh, wants to uh, communicate with. Um, so uh, ideally, you want to translate uh, these uh, numbers into some human readable strengths to, to know uh, what, what the device, is, uh, what the interface number represents, it, whether it's a keyboard or mouse or, or a network card or <laughs> such a thing. And uh, of course, there are limitations to, to this solution because uh, the USB, uh, any USB device can be faked uh, and cloned. So if somebody, if you create a policy that allows a USB keyboard to be connected to your system, then somebody can just uh, take the keyboard, clone it, and he can then reprogram the firmware uh, to, to like insert some uh, open keystrokes or something. So all he needs to pass the policy is uh, actually to have the metadata of the of the device, uh, like the serial number, or the vendor ID, the product ID, and you can uh, actually, you don't have to, with some devices, you don't have to uh, steal them, you just, it, it's just enough to look at them, and then uh, look up the information on, on the, on the uh, manufacturer page. Uh, 
So, uh, because usually the uh, the USB devices uh, do not export uh, serial numbers, like thumb drives usually do, but USB keyboards they are just empty or they are same for all all the uh, all the products of the company. They're just like one, two, three, four, just some uh, value. So it's, uh, it's quite uh, hard to actually uh, distinguish two pieces of the same product from each other from the point of view USB drive or from the point of uh, the current. Another problem is uh, when those specific uh, The interface types have a hierarchy, a standard hierarchy, uh, and some vendors do not like uh, do not follow this hierarchy. They, they use a special value that uh, says, OK, this is a vendor specific type, or the vendor specific driver. And you don't know what's in it. So uh, if, you, if you have like a bunch of these devices, then it's, uh, it's not a good idea to actually uh, use them in your policies and allow them. Because uh, like somebody can exploit the, the fact that uh, it allows uh, this vendor specific thing and you can uh, create a phone device and uh, attack your system using uh, something else. Uh, USB keyboards are especially um, problematic because, as I said, they don't export the serial number, so you cannot distinguish them uh, from each other. <coughs> yeah, I, have, I think I have some time, so I will show you some example policies. Uh, I didn't want to show, that, show them uh, before because uh, uh, it, uh, you know, uh, it looks scary uh, to, to have some bunch of lines uh, in a strange language. Uh, but actually, it's uh, quite easy if you, like, uh, if you are just a uh, uh, regular uh, notebook user. And you all you want to to use is uh, our USB phone drives. Then you can write this one line in the in the policy, and it will allow only phone drives and nothing else. So it uh, somebody inside a phone drive with a keyboard inside, then it won't be allowed because uh, the system sees that there are two interfaces on the system on the on the device, and this uh, rule only allows uh, only one. Interface to be on on the USB. Uh, yeah, some other examples. You can play Russian roulette uh, with USB devices. It's a special condition that uh, on each evaluation returns uh, like a random true or false with uh, the specified probability. So you insert your device and it's rejected uh, with uh, high probability. This is a CLI usage uh, example. You can, from the command line, you can list the devices, uh, list the rules, or append new rules. So it's quite easy to interact with the demon uh, that way. Yeah, and that's all. Thank you, Daniel. Um, I So we have a couple of minutes for questions. I will put the question first. Uh, does this work on servers as well? Yes, it does. But you have to run the demon down. Yeah, that might not be desired. So you know, the USB guard is blocked on the device. Is there theoretically any room for malicious code to be run lower down on the hardware, sort of below the driver? Uh, assuming it's blocked, then the only uh, driver that's interacting with uh, the device is actually the USB core driver. And if there is an exploit, then yeah, it will uh, so much exposed. But I think it's so much exposed, uh, the driver is so much exposed with that, so check like how fast then try to do it on the it's more obvious. So it's, uh, there is no, there's a small probability that it's, uh, there is a bucket. But here, yeah. <laughs> 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 
I can't hear actually. I can't hear the question. Oh, sorry. So, especially keyboards and master things, since you don't uh, want to understand the serial number files. I think you played with the uh, TNC. Um, you do have something like automation. Default, 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 default,
So, so that we need to integrate into the X. So the, 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 question, the question is like how you can uh, click on, or, on something in, or, or write something if you don't have the device at all, uh, if you don't have a keyboard at all. And that's why it's one of the reasons I implemented the room conditions. You can uh, have like all the keyboard keyboard should be connected, but then the condition like. Uh, uh, Tells you that, or tells the using assistant not to connect any other keyboard. Okay. So no matter the port or, or no matter what, uh, no other keyboard. If one is already allowed, then you can connect another one. That's like implementable on the on the policy level. Okay. Thank you, Daniel.